Welcome to the Groundless Ground Podcast. Join me, Lisa Dale Miller, at the leading edge of mental health. This is an integrative, embodied approach to psychobiological well being. I'll riff on integrative psychotherapy, offer contemplative practices, and we'll hear from an amazing array of pioneering clinicians, researchers, and academics. I'm ready to go. How about you? Welcome to the first episode of the Groundless Ground podcast. I've worn many creative hats in my life, and recently I decided, in addition to seeing patients in my private practice, why not do what I love most for a wider audience? And what I love most is to disseminate leading-edge information that awakens, transforms, and heals, and dialogue with really smart, deeply thoughtful researchers, clinicians, and academics. I thought it might be best to begin by building some context, for my clinical and contemplative contexts are not the norm. Integrative psychotherapy is relatively new, more accurately, the idea that there is just a mind or brain driving a person's mental health has really started to become eclipsed by the new biology, and this means mental health professionals must start to acknowledge the critical role the physical body, microbial communities, and the autonomic nervous system play in the arising and maintenance of mental and emotional well-being. My clinical work is also informed by extensive knowledge of Buddhist psychology and many decades of Buddhist and yogic contemplative practice. The Groundless Ground podcast is a platform for me to share this knowledge and offer some of the targeted meditative skills I often deliver to patients for specific mental health maladies like anxiety, depression, trauma, addiction, and emotion dysregulation. For more in-depth information on Buddhist psychology, I invite clinicians to explore the textbook I authored in 2014 titled Effortless Mindfulness, Genuine Mental Health Through Awakened Presence. It's available digitally and in print pretty much everywhere. Let's get started with today's episode. Why call this podcast The Groundless Ground? The Groundless Ground is described by the Chetzog Tibetan Buddhist tradition as a pristine lucidity, vast and open, where nothing is left out or fixated upon. It also signifies the interdependence of all internal and external phenomena, and is associated with perceptual clarity, profound insight, and non-referential compassion. These are the vital components of what I call embodied innate well-being, in other words, of genuine mental health. According to Buddhist philosophy, primordial ignorance is the habitual embedded reification of internal and external phenomena as permanent, independent, and unchanging. And due to the pervasive delusion of primordial ignorance, Buddhist philosophy also posits that human perception has been distorted since what they call the beginningless beginning. Direct recognition of the way things are is known in the Buddhist teachings as wise view. Wise view is the first of the eightfold path factors. The practical experience of wise view is described in Buddhist psychology as comprehending the true nature of objects and experiences as impermanent, empty of any separate self-existence, and comprised of utterly groundless, discreetly arising, existing, and cessating moments of perception. One of my Tibetan Buddhist teachers, Minja Rinpoche, says, quote, we put ourselves into prison and we are the prison guards, unquote. The inner prison Minja Rinpoche is speaking of is comprised of mind-generated, distorted narratives of who we think we are and the way we think things are. To free ourselves from this prison, we must have clear comprehension of what I call the illusion of continuance and security. Truthfully, most of us can relate to this notion of an illusory sense of continuance and security. We truly believe our internally generated assumptive concepts. Here are some common fallacies many of us have. 
this relationship can't end, this job will always be here for me, this loved one won't die, this body won't grow old, this house or town or country or political system will always be this way, calamity will not visit me or my loved ones. And then, when life shows up, as it often does, in ways that are not of our liking or with our consent, that is when we realize how devastatingly wrong our mentally constructed schemas of continuance and security actually are. When things fall apart, our assumptions of security and continuance are blown away. And many of us get lost in feelings of anger, devastation, and frustration. If we can instead meet falling apart as an aha moment, it really makes the difference between feeling free or feeling imprisoned by life's ups and downs, between experiencing suffering or non-suffering, even in the midst of challenging conditions, between feeling overwhelmed by cognitive affective distress or opening to emotional flexibility and mental clarity. Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist psychology posit deep within the human psyche an ever-turning engine that gives rise to the perceptual distortion of subject-object dualism. This is called innate reification, and that is reifying an inner eye and an outer world. This innate reification is, for me, one of the primary sources of cognitive affective human suffering. To cut through such a deeply embedded psychic distortion one must dissemble the delusion of inside and outside, self and other. In other words, one must cultivate wise view. When my patients are in the presence of their distorted internal concepts and experiencing cognitive affective reactivity, I offer the following twofold intervention they can use right there in the moment to actuate the arising of wise view and shift mental rigidity, and emotional reactivity into flexibility and responsiveness. The first step is to point out the phenomenality of the field of mind and its contents. This is a critical first step because the reified eye rules the narrative constructive process and spins a really convincing story that the thoughts and feelings we have really are us and they are true an accurate depiction of experience. People don't comprehend the field of mind, nor do they recognize the contents of mind as just internal phenomena continually coming and going in the field of mind. Now, this is not just philosophical mumbo-jumbo. This is skewed perception obstructing clear cognition. Cultivating wise view in this case refers to recognizing the field of mind and its contents as impermanent, empty of any separate self-existence, and comprised of utterly groundless, discreetly arising, existing, and cessating moments of perception. This process is not difficult to understand or even to do, because when the field of mind and its contents are pointed out, they become immediately apparent. Once the field of mind and its contents are known, then I draw the patient's awareness into the contextual richness of basic physicality as it actually is. Basic physicality is awareness of the experience the body is already having. This is a basic aliveness which is characterized by four qualities. Feelings of embodiment, embeddedness, extendedness, and inactivity. Any of you who are familiar with 4E cognition will recognize these neuroscience terms. For somatically oriented mental health professionals, the 4Es are an intercorporeal dance of body, mind, contents, and world, all simultaneously arising, existing, and passing away. In fact, 4E cognition is bodily experience as it actually is, from a nervous system point of view. This process 
of landing in the actuality of experience is easy to facilitate when a clinician works with a palette of integrative psychological and somatic therapeutic skills. We'll hear more about 4E cognition and these kinds of skills in future episodes. For now, I'll just say it involves deliberate placing of attention on mental, emotional, and autonomic nervous system distress, and then resting awareness in the body's organismic capacity to heal its own autonomic wounding and homeostatic imbalances. Wise view cuts through distorted, reified inner narratives and their resulting feelings of separateness. Wise view can be a gateway into or an outcome of embodied presence. Embodied presence is an intercorporeally connected physicality that the body is already experiencing. We'll hear lots more about embodied presence in upcoming episodes. It might help if I share a couple of patient reports that accurately portray the feeling of landing firmly in the refuge of intercorporeally connected physicality. This first patient report comes from a gentleman who'd been working with me around six months at this point. He came partly because he had a chronic trauma history, but mostly because he was suffering with a very unrelenting anxiety disorder, which manifested particularly whenever he felt any kind of bodily sensation, it sent him into a terror. So here's his report after about six months of landing in embodied presence and working with awareness of the field of mind and its contents. I woke up about 3 a.m. with a fast heart rate and thoughts of impending doom. Becoming aware of the bodily feeling of anxiety allowed me to relax into the experience of anxiety. My mind was with the reality of my bed, the warmth and comfort of being in the dark. No threat, no danger, just seeing mind for what it was. Reality was in my body. I felt a distance from the anxiety, which was so compelling and clear. The thoughts of sudden death, impending doom, things I had done wrong cycled through, but I stayed with them and they felt just like racing thoughts. Then I returned awareness to my body, my refuge. What a transformation. Here is someone who six months prior would be sent into an anxious terror by any bodily sensation. Now this person is resting in his body, which he now considers a refuge. This next report is from a woman who had a fairly severe childhood trauma history. She used alcohol as a way to self-medicate the chronic anxiety that she experienced in her life. This is a report after quite some time of working together. I arrived at a gathering and was not feeling anxious like I normally do. It was so strange. I had known many of the guests for years and had intense opinions about them. Lots of those opinions were negative or fearful. But somehow I found myself not judging them, just being with them as they are. I let them talk and really listened without the stream of anxious, negative self-talk. I was actually with them. After some time, the hostess asked if I would like a glass of wine. Normally, I would have already had at least one or two glasses of wine by that time to lessen the anxiety of talking to people. I said yes, but it didn't really make much of a difference in how I felt about them or me. I realized the story I'd been telling myself about my anxiety and what alcohol did for me, why I needed it, was completely false. That is awakening in the here and the now to reality as it actually is. Both these patient experiences represent the confidence and fearlessness that spontaneously arises in the aliveness of embodied presence. And also, it describes a kind of workability that comes along with a feeling of interbeingness. 
This interbeingness is an integration of mind, contents, body, and world that immediately dissolves the distortions of subject-object dualism. If our goal as clinicians is a wiser, more compassionate world, then we have to offer our disembodied, anesthetized population tools to re-inhabit and reconnect with the wisdom of intercorporeality. Interbeingness is the liberation of genuine mental health that I believe every patient deserves to receive from psychological counseling. Thanks for listening to today's show. To find out more or get in touch, visit groundlessground.com. Let's close by dedicating our efforts to the healing of our planet and all its inhabitants. See you next time on the Groundless Ground.